Good morning and welcome to our Friday morning Bible class on Ephesians. While people are logging in, we'll just do a brief review of some of our more recent uh, lessons from here in Ephesians chapter 2. You might remember that as we began looking at this chapter, we pointed out that he shows us two before and after pictures. The first before picture is in verses 1 through 3 here in Ephesians chapter 2 as he's reminding them of how they once walked and they had been dead in trespasses and sins. He says that they had been serving the prince of the power of the air. They were walking according to the spirit of disobedience. Uh, they had their uh, pleasure in fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and of the mind. And they were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And Paul includes himself there, said we all were in that condition. And if we were left to ourselves and didn't have anything else to rely upon, then we would all be doomed because that verses three, uh, 1 through 3 here in Ephesians 2 paints a picture for us of gloom and doom and despair. It's a desperate situation we would be in and we would not have any hope. But then the contrast comes in verse 4 where he says, But God, God intervened. God takes the initiative. God made a, a preparation, and as we saw in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, according to his intention, his purpose, his plan, uh, God takes the initiative and makes for us, prepared for us, a way out. And that way out is through Jesus Christ. And of course, we looked at verses 4 through 10 and pointed out the blessings that God gives us all of them being found in Jesus Christ. This is an expansion of what Paul says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, that all spiritual blessings are to be found in Christ Jesus. Then we spent quite a bit of time, we spent two whole lessons just on verse 8, or verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul says, and it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not lest anyone should boast. Now, a lot of people have uh, drawn conclusion from that, that we are so saved at the point of faith. As soon as we say or accept Jesus into our heart and recite sometimes what's called the sinner's prayer, which we pointed out is not found anywhere in Scripture, but a lot of people say that that's all that it takes to be saved, that there is no obedience, no further obedience involved in it. But we pointed out that when we look to how the writer of this letter Look at his conversion as it's recorded for us in Acts chapters 9, 22, and 26, three different times. You'll find that Paul there recounts, or Luke in Acts chapter 9, and then Paul in Acts chapters 22 and 26, recounts his uh, conversion and what was taking place during that time. And we find that after he had prayed for three days and nights, after the Lord revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus, Remember, the Lord didn't tell him what else to do except to go into the city, told him to go to a house on the street called Straight, the house of Judas, and then wait. Wait for someone to come and tell you what else to do. During that time of waiting, he fasted and prayed for three days. But that didn't save him. The appearance of the Lord on the road didn't save him. The fasting and praying for three days didn't save him. How do we know that? Because according to Acts chapter 22, verse 16, after the appearance of Jesus and after his three days of praying, he was still told to get up and be baptized and notice to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So when Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 that you are saved by grace through faith, He's not saying there that that grace and faith excludes our obedience by our repentance and our baptism. And then we looked also at how the Ephesians would have understood it. And we looked back to Acts chapter 9, 19, verses 1 through 7, and we saw there that those people would not have thought that there was no obedience involved in their uh, being saved because they obeyed the gospel. Remember, they had been baptized, the core of them, 12 men, had been baptized under John's baptism. But then when they learned the rest of the story, they were baptized again upon the authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so these men certainly, and it may very well have been one of those men reading this letter, since they were apparently the core group of uh, Christians there in Ephesus, one of those men may very well have been the one reading this letter. He would not have understood it, and his audience would not have understood these verses, verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians 2, to have excluded their obedience by being baptized into Jesus Christ. The word grace is used here to include all that God has done in the preparation and in the revelation of his will for our salvation. And the word faith is used as an umbrella to include all of our response of obedience to God's grace. Well, today we come to verses 11 through 22, the second part of Ephesians chapter 2. And just as verses 1 through 10 show us both a before and after picture, so these verses also show another before and after picture. Verses 12, 11 and 12 show us a before picture. And in this section, Paul is addressing especially uh, the, the uh, section, the part of the church there at Ephesus is composed of the Gentiles. Remember that there would have been Jewish uh, people from a Jewish background as well as people from a Gentile background who had been uh, baptized into Christ, who had obeyed the gospel. They uh, made up the church there. And so now he's addressing especially the, the Gentile part of that congregation, those who came from that background. Notice what he says in verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now he's describing their life beforehand. If you want to look and get a, uh, an even more detailed picture of the Gentile world of Paul's day, look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. It's more, much more detailed. But here, he's telling, this is what you were. Notice he says in verse 11, at one time. And then a little bit later, he says that at that time in verse uh, uh, 12. Looking back, remember this, this is what at one time you were, at that time you were these things, and notice those words that he uses. He uses words such as separated, alienated, without hope, without God. All those words are, are terrible words. It describes a very ugly, gloomy, desperate situation. And so... Here we have, just like verses 1 through 3, the before picture, ugly, desperate. Here in verses 11 and 12, again, another ugly and desperate before picture. And remember, look back at verse 4. He shows, he introduces the contrast then. But God, now, here in verse 13, he says, but now... In other words, this is what you were, but this is what you are. This is what you have become. He says, beginning at verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So notice here the, the, the change uh, it goes from, from darkness, from gloom, from despair. Now it goes to brightness and hope and glory and all these great things. Now you'll notice several times in there where Paul talks about both, 
or he talks about uh, us and them, or us and you. Remember, he's addressing Gentiles. Paul himself came from a Jewish background, and that's what he's talking about here, to make of the two, or to make of both, one new man. What Paul is saying is that in Christ, there's no longer Gentile and Jew. He'll explicitly say this in greater detail in Galatians chapter 3. But what he's saying is that Jew and Gentile, when they come together in Jesus Christ, that's not the main criteria. It's not a matter of your background and what you had been and how you were raised and what your, your racial or your national or your linguistic background is. Now it has to do with your identity in Jesus Christ. We need this same lesson today. You substitute black and white for the expressions Jew and Gentile. The lesson is exactly the same. You take any nationality or any race you want to, you put them in here. The lesson is the same. In Christ Jesus, we're brought together in one body. What is that body? Well, if you look back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul has identified that body as the church. That's the body over which Christ is the head. He'll mention this again over in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, that just as the Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of the wife. But he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body, the church, which is his body. We find in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, he brings Jew and Gentile together. He brings black and white together. He brings Americans and other nationalities all together in one body. He doesn't have a church for all these different races and all these nationalities. One body, one church brings all people together. That's the intention that God had. That's his purpose. That's his plan. But then look at several other things that Paul says here. I want you to notice the blessings. In contrast to what he says up earlier when he talks about separation and alienation and being hopeless and godless, and he'll mention again a little bit later down in uh, verse uh, 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Notice the blessings that he points out in this section here in verses uh, 12 through 22. All right. Verses 13 through 22. Notice he says that now you who once were far off, that's referring to you who were Gentiles, you once were far off, but you have been brought near. Now there is nearness. Now there's no longer that separation. Now you've been brought near. And how? By the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says that you are now a new creation. He's made of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new person. What is that? It's a Christian created in Christ Jesus. He says that now there's no longer enmity and hostility. Now there's peace. First of all, peace between us and God. And then there's peace between us and our fellow man. Again, breaking down those barriers. He mentions the barriers, and probably he's talking about, and as a matter of fact, it, it mentions especially the law of commandments. The law of Moses had been given to the people of Israel to kind of build a hedge around them of protection. It was like a security fence to keep them from being uh, assimilated and to taking on to, for themselves all of the uh, different you know, things that the nations around them were doing to maintain their separate identity. But what it had become was a barrier between them and actually fulfilling God's purpose in being the light to the world. And so that barrier had to be brought down. And now they can be both one again in that one body through Jesus Christ. You've been brought near and there's peace between you and those with whom you at once had hostility and enmity. He says next you are reconciled. Reconciled by the blood of the cross, by his cross. To reconcile means to bring back on, on friendly terms. And again, the reconciliation, first and foremost, has reference with our relationship with God. But it also has to do with reconciliation with fellow man. And then next, he says that you have access to the Father. No longer are you shut out. No longer are you so far away. No longer are you in that hopeless and des desperate situation. Now you have access to God. Again, it's in Christ.
Christ Jesus. And then he says, you ha are now fellow citizens. No longer are you strangers and aliens. You're fellow citizens. No longer are you kind of shut out and you uh, don't have access to blessings and things such as that. Now, now you have access to God again through Jesus Christ. And you are members of the household. Perhaps a better word for household here would be your members of the family. Members of the family. Uh, several years ago, and I'm thinking now back over 40 years ago, when the Pittsburgh Pirates won the World Series in 1979, they had a theme song. It was, We Are Family. Well, we are family in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings us together. We're members of the household of God. Family. He says in verse 21, you are now a holy temple. Well, you look back to the Old Testament, the temple in, that Solomon built. Before that, the tabernacle that was built during the days of Moses. That's where the Lord was uh, dwelling. Uh, not, it didn't contain him. He wasn't limited there, but that was a special place that God inhabited. And it was mentioned at the end of the book of Exodus when the tabernacle was finished. Remember, the cloud uh, filled the tabernacle so that Moses and nobody else could go in it. And the same thing happened when Solomon built the temple over in 1 Kings. The glory of the Lord, that cloud, the Shekinah glory, filled it. Well, now it's not a physical temple in Jerusalem. Now it's the Lord's church, the Lord's body that is that holy temple, by a dwelling place for God by his spirit. So notice, all of this is available because of Jesus Christ, mainly because of the blood that he shed at the cross, bringing us together in this one body, and providing for us all of these spiritual blessings. Remember, when we're reading here about Gentiles in the New Testament, we need to be especially grateful because nearly everybody who's hearing my voice this morning come from that Gentile background. I don't know very many people who are Jews. I've met several and know some, but that's a very uh, great minority in my own uh, personal experience. But we come from a Gentile background, and we need to be very grateful for what God has done in Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to be a national hero. He came to be the Savior of the whole world, and that's where we can have our blessings. Well, thank you for listening to our uh, Bible class tonight and joining with us. Thank you for all the comments that you're making on Facebook. And we uh, ask that you might uh, join us again Tuesday morning for our next study from Ephesians. Sunday morning, Lord willing, we'll be meeting at the building for our morning services at 1030. Uh, those services will be broadcast live on our website as well as on our Facebook page here. Sunday night, we'll be having just a Facebook Live only. We will not be meeting together physically, but we will be having a lesson at 5 o'clock Sunday night. Then we'll be back here, Lord willing, Tuesday morning for our next uh, Bible study from the book of Ephesians. Thank you again, and until next time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.